leptons go through the hole with no ability to control the situation, we find out that the photons again create a blob like this. But now we're going to do something a little different. And I think everybody here, more or less, or more or less everybody, knows what I'm going to do. I'm going to open a second hole. Okay, but let's think about what classical randomness would do. Classical randomness would simply mean that, we, and we also imagine that this beam of photons is at its origin a little bit uncertain and a little bit random, so that some photons begin a little bit upward, some photons a little bit downward, some photons go through the upper hole, some photons go through the lower hole. If a photon goes through the upper hole, it may or may not get a random kick and get knocked off, uh, off course if it goes through the lower hole. It also gets a random kick. Now we're imagining the photons come through one at a time. We could even imagine a... It's okay. <laughs> I do that all the time. Uh, where was I? Yes, the photons get a kick. We're imagining that the photons come through one at a time, very sparsely, and so what one photon does doesn't influence a later photon because the later photon comes through so much later that whatever gave the first photon a kick is already finished happening and it's waiting for the next uh, throw of the dice. In fact, the next photon may come through a hundred throws of the dice later, and so we expect the next photon uh, to be random, statistically independent of the first photon, under those circumstances, what we would expect, well, let's, uh, let's, let's decide what we would expect. Supposing only one hole is open, if only one hole was open, then we would see a blob of illumination like that, with a profile that might look something like that. Supposing we closed up the first blob, the first hole, and opened the second hole, Close the first one, open the second one. All right, so first we begin with just one hole. Then we close the first hole and open the second hole. What would you expect to see? What you would expect to see under those circumstances is a different blob slightly displaced from the first one. The blue blob wouldn't be there because we closed the first hole. The green blob would be there because we opened the second hole. Now. What happens if we open both holes? What happens if you open both holes in classical mechanics is the probability for a photon to get to the screen at any given point is the sum of the probabilities for it to get there by either route. The photon, photon can either go through the upper route or it can go through the lower route if both holes are open. The probability to get to this point over here, let's call it the green point over here, the probability to get over there is the probability to go through the upper hole and arrive at the green point, plus the probability to get to go through the lower hole and arrive at the green point. So the result is, in classical physics, you would always see the signal over here, the profile over here, just being the sum of the two probability distributions. And it would look, I wish I had another color. They never leave me enough colors. All right. Uh, we would see something which would look like just a higher, I don't know, it would be much, it would be bigger than that. It would look like that. And in particular, if there was any point over here such that the photon could arrive either from one hole or from the other hole, or both, then we would find illumination at that point for sure by opening both holes. Okay? That's what classical logic, let's, let's call it by its right name, classical logic, that's what classical logic, classical statistics, classical probability would dictate for a series of particles coming through here, one at a time. Right? When they come through one at a time, they make blip, 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 but the average probability of the distribution of blips would be a distribution which would be the sum of the two distributions. What happens if you really do this experiment? 
you find what's called an interference pattern. The interference pattern looks like this. Well, let's see if we can get it right. In particular, well, first of all, what is this figure? This figure is a probability distribution, and it tells you the horizontal axis here tells you what the probability of a photon getting to a particular point at a particular height here. But in particular, it says that there are no photons which arrive at that point. There are no photons which arrive at that point. There are no photons which arrive at that point. This is odd. If you opened only one hole, then you would find a probability distribution which wasn't zero. In other words, you would find illumination at that point. You open the other hole, you still find illumination at that point. You open both holes, and all of a sudden, no photon gets to that point, even though they're coming, in, coming through once every 20 minutes or once every 20 years. And therefore, how can they know about each other? Nevertheless, if you open both holes, there will be places where no photons can get to despite the fact that photons arrived at those points when only one hole was open. That is, um, you might be able to sit down and work up some, in, some interesting but rather elaborate mechanism to make this happen. You could imagine elaborate, complicated mechanisms where uh, somehow the, this this uh, screen here, some degrees of freedom inside the screen, remember how many photons went through, and they remember what they're supposed to do. But it would be a rather elaborate mechanism just for this one purpose. This phenomenon of interference, of destructive interference, this is called destructive interference, that the probabilities cancel instead of adding at certain points. That's a very generic property in, uh, in quantum mechanics. And so it requires a kind of explanation which is not some detailed, mechanical, complicated explanation. It requires a, a broad new idea about how statistics works and how, about how the logic of, um, of quantum mechanics works. So that's the first really weird thing that happens in quantum mechanics. Now let me give you another example. If you remember, in the last course, we talked a little bit about reversibility. We talked about the laws of physics. In particular, we talked about the laws of physics for discrete systems. For example, uh, we discussed the possible laws of physics, deterministic laws of physics, for a coin which can either be heads or tails. Now, of course, flipping the coin, that introduces a level of um, of uncertainty, a level of uh, uh, statistics, probability into things, I want to think about the deterministic laws. The truly deterministic laws are the ones that whatever the coin is doing, it will tell you what the coin is doing next. So when we discussed this last quarter, we talked about two possible laws of physics. The first was that if you find heads, in the next instant, when you look at it, after an instant of time, you'll find heads again. If tails, 